principles is you, do, you should point out mistakes. We'll talk about that. Yeah. All right. Ooh, that's always loud. All right. Greetings. I can't believe this didn't, this didn't draw more people than my Gaza talk. I'm just shocked. Anyway, it's cold. <laughs> And last time we had more people at night than we had in the morning, which is a reverse of how it was pre-COVID. But anyway, thank you for coming. And uh, I, th I was working on this. I thought, if nobody comes, this is fun for me because um, space, God, space, Bible, and space. Uh, I grew up on, um, you know, watching Star Trek. I went to opening day of the movie 2001. I had binoculars. I had a telescope as a kid. Dreamed of being an astronaut. Uh, this will date me. But when John Glenn went up in space to orbit the Earth, um, uh, schools didn't have any technology. So I remember we were outside in a breezeway, and a teacher had a TV out there and had tinfoil around the antenna going up, and we're watching this grainy picture, and we're just thrilled beyond all measure. Somebody had gone up in space and had orbited the Earth, which was uh, incredible. Uh, I only later realized that John Kennedy had made this great speech about going to the moon, and uh, I would love him for that. If nothing else, I remember tracking the uh, space program pretty carefully. This is a photo of a guy named Ed White, uh, who's gone on to his maker now, who was the first person successfully to walk in space. If you remember any of this, a couple other people tried it, and they were bouncing around. It wasn't going well. Ed White somehow had the knack. Uh, and then uh, that's not Neil Armstrong. That would be a mistake, Bert, because nobody was there to take the photo of Neil Armstrong coming down. That's Buzz Aldrin uh, stepping uh, onto the moon's surface. Absolutely amazing. And then since then, you have all these other things like the thrilling movie Apollo 13, which I hope you have seen. If you haven't, uh, I've seen it many times. You know, they go up and they have all these malfunctions and somehow they manage to get back uh, to Earth. So uh, space is pretty interesting. I, um, when I take people to Assisi on my St. Francis tours, uh, we go to this uh, high mountain hermitage where Francis loved to go and pray. And uh, he was famous for, you know, one, sleeping out uh, on stone in the open, but he also loved to lie on his back and just look up and pray and think. So there's, there's an odd statue of St. Francis lying down. I had to pose next to him, of course. And uh, the text that's interesting there is Psalm 8 which I'll just read for you, thinking of space. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You whose glory above the heavens is chanted by the mouths of babes and infants. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little less than God, you crown him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and so on. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name uh, in all the earth. Uh, when we read the Bible, the thing about space is um, it, it's a little bit of a challenge because they lived, I remember when I went to, uh, I took a religion course as an undergraduate, and they said, Bible people believed in a three-story universe. If you think of a three-story universe, we're like in the middle story here. There's a story below, that's like hell and so on. Then there's a story above, which would be heaven. So you have these interesting stories of, for instance, Jesus ascending into heaven. Well, if you take the Bible literally, you've got a problem, right? Because he, he's defying gravity, which maybe he could do, but I mean, where would he go up there? What would he breathe? Is he going up? Or is that a literal depiction of spiritual uh, realities? Uh, I love the Dali painting, <laughs> the ascension of Jesus. It's like they're looking up at his feet, um, which is cool. Uh, creation. Um, the uh, William Blake, ancient of days, God creating the world. The creation stories. Uh, recently, I was asked to review a book by the novelist Marilyn Robinson. Do you know Marilyn Robinson? She wrote Gilead and uh, other very fine novels. She has written a book on Genesis. It's called Reading Genesis. She reads the book of Genesis and writes about it, and it's amazing. My review is uh, kind of two sentences, two words, like, it's amazing. They wanted me to say more than that. 
Uh, one of the things she talks about in there is that Israel's neighbors had creation stories, and Israel's creation story is so different from their neighbors. For their neighbors, there's chaos, and there are gods that are bickering with each other, and because of that, we, you know, one creates some water and another makes a storm, and they're just in a mood all the time. And she points out that uh, for Israel's creation story, Genesis chapter 1, uh, it's calm, it's serene. It's peaceful. Day by day, God says, let there be, and those things come to be. Uh, what's interesting in Genesis is, uh, this thing's moving on me. In Genesis 1, you would think that the uh, creation of the heavens, of the skies, would be on which day? You, you think it'd be like day one or two, tops, right? <laughs> But actually, in Genesis, uh, God creates, gosh, some animals and all before it comes to the fourth day of creation where God says, Genesis 1, 14, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let the, let the lights be the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater lights rule the day. The lesser lights rule the night. He made the stars also. And it goes on, and it says, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day, and God saw that it was good. Um, pretty interesting. Uh, that was radical, but it doesn't sound radical to you that God created the stars and the moon. For Israel's neighbors, uh, for many of them, the stars were deities, right? They saw the stars moving. They thought, oh, th those are gods up there, and they tracked all of that. Uh, for many of Israel's neighbors, the moon was a deity. The sun was a deity, So, right? So, uh, these heavenly beings are, to Israel's neighbors, themselves deities. Uh, in Israel's image of things, uh, they are things that God created. Uh, Psalm 147. Um, it was fun finding this stuff, getting ready for today. Psalm 147. Oh, my glasses are terrible. Verse 4 says, God determines the number of the stars, and that word determines might actually mean count. God counts the number of the stars. He gives all of them their names. I think you can get a star named for you right now, right? Like, you know, the, the Lori Guy star. It's like a birth. <laughs> I don't know how that holds or works. Uh, what Israel is saying is that the, these are not deities up here. Uh, they actually, God made them. God has counted them. How would you count all the stars? Uh, and God has given all of them uh, names, uh, which is a lovely uh, thing. The stars up there actually praise God instead of being God. Psalm 148, verse 3, praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, uh, all of you shining stars. Uh, ancient people believed that as the star, they noticed that the stars were moving, uh, and they believed that they made music as they moved along, uh, which is a lovely uh, idea. Job chapter 38 actually names constellations, right? We have constellations. Uh, so people noticed uh, patterns and all in the movement of the stars. Uh, one of the things that this uh, has led to through history is astrology. Pretty much in the Bible, astrology is condemned as a fake science, and you should not dabble in astrology. How funny is it then that uh, the first distant visitors to visit the Christ child are who? The Magi. The Magi are not wise men. They are not kings. They are Magi in the world would have been astrologers. It's kind of a joke in a way. Uh, God can even use astrology to reach out to people. Uh, to let them know the good news that God has come down to earth uh, in the Christ child. Uh, one of the things that uh, people have loved to ask is, you know, okay, if there were magi, what were they actually following? And so scientists can go back and say what was in the sky about the year 4 B.C. when Jesus was born. There are theories about this, like Jupiter and Saturn were close to each other at that time, or maybe it was a comet. Um, it's kind of funny anyway. Uh, body humor, uh, the Monty Python film, The Life of Brian, which is a great source of biblical understanding. If you haven't seen it, uh, if you're offended by bad language, don't watch it. It's got a lot of that. Uh, and the story really begins where the Magi are out looking, and they're looking up, and naturally, what happens? They go to the wrong house. Well, if you're following a star, it's way up there anyway. You most likely would come to the wrong house. How would you know it was this place to come and find them? And it's kind of comical. Um, 
Brian's mother's trying to get rid of them. And because and, she said, you don't sound, seem very wise to me sneaking around in the dark like this. Then they said, well, we brought gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And she says, well, why didn't you say so? Come stay a while. I mean, it's a hilarious, um, it's a hilarious thing. So, uh, the history of science has been interesting theologically. Um, when we went to Poland uh, to visit the work that uh, our church is supporting uh, for Ukrainian refugees coming across the border into Poland, uh, one of the things that you find there is Nicholas Copernicus, he was Polish, so a lot of places there's statues to Copernicus. And do you know this from school? What did Copernicus figure out? What's his claim to fame? <laughs> Um, at, well, a lot of things, actually. Uh, but uh, part of what Copernicus realized is up to that point, not everyone, but at least many people thought that the earth was at the center of everything and things moved around us, which seems like a logical conclusion if you just look up and think, like, oh, that seems to be right. And Copernicus said, and no, actually, you know, we're part of, of what is moving. Uh, they call this the Copernican Revolution, which is pretty interesting. Uh, when I was in seminary, a guy named Thomas Kuhn had written a book called, I better look it up to get the title right, Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he talks about how at some points in history, science isn't just incremental, you know, a little bit more knowledge, but sometimes there's a total revolution. So with Copernicus, science changes entirely. So instead of the earth being the center, we're not the center that sort of throws everything off. Theologically, that's pretty interesting, right? Because we always thought, well, the world, our world is the center of everything, but actually it's not the center. You could think about that theologically for yourself. I feel like the center of the world. America feels like the center of the world. It turns out neither of those are actually uh, the center of the world. Uh, this kind of thing made the church very nervous. And so our hero in this respect is Galileo. Uh, Galileo, almost 100 years after Copernicus, um, he, he looked up and he measured what he saw and drew conclusions from it that, you know, yes, the, the stars move, we're moving around the sun, and he got called on the carpet by the church uh, authorities. Uh, and there's kind of a funny moment that uh, historians wonder whether it's true or not. In 1633, he's called uh, on trial before church authorities, and they say, you must recant of your science. You must say, the earth does not move. And he was a devout, devout churchman, and he didn't want to lose his place in the church or be excommunicated, so he said, it does not move. The earth does not move. But then the story is that as he was exiting the room, like, he, he couldn't leave well enough alone. He's leaving, and he said, Really, it does move. <laughs> I don't know if that's historically true or not, but it's supposed to be true. Galileo wrote uh, these words. I believe that the intention of the Holy Bible is to persuade us towards salvation, something science could never do. Only the Holy Spirit can move us. But I do not think that we must believe that the same God who gave us our intellect would have us put it aside and not use it. It's been a huge debate, and this still goes on in the world. Uh, my friends, every now and then you read about some school board, I always say, you know, like in rural Mississippi, some of them are in North Carolina, uh, want to put aside textbooks that pass along, what, modern science. Uh, I had a parent here come to me the other day. Their child is in a private school and the dad was very disturbed because the child came home and said, they were telling us in school that God really did create the world in six literal days. We don't believe that, do we? And the dad's, he's got a dilemma, right? <laughs> Does he throw the school teacher under the bus? I would say yes, uh, politely and with some clarifications. So this is in Charlotte, North Carolina. We have teachers who were teaching. The world was really just, you know, not very old at all. Uh, and God really did create it in um, six days. Um, it's so interesting, and he and I talked about it, and he said, how do I talk to her about it? Uh, and there are a lot of things. You can talk, kids are interested in the dinosaur record, so the fossil record of dinosaurs creates some issues if the world was created in six days. For me, simply the uh, speed of light. If you think about the speed of light, when you go out at night and you look at the skies, and uh, that light has been coming to you 
they tell us, for thousands, even tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. How fast does light move? It's really fast. So it's been coming a very long way for a very uh, long time. This is not a bad thing for a child to learn. This is a good thing for a child to learn, to have their mind blowed, for our awe to be uh, increased. Uh, is a wonderful thing. Uh, when we lived in Davidson, uh, I had a neighbor who lived down the street that a couple of you may have known, a man named Ralph Gable. Uh, you may know Ralph because uh, after his wife Wendell died, he moved to Charlotte to Aldersgate and came to our church for a long time. Ralph taught physics and chemistry at Davidson College. <laughs> Uh, and he would do this great thing. He lived right up the street from us. He would often call me and say, come to my house now and bring your children. It might be midnight. It's back in landline days. And so I'd get the kids out of the bed. We'd go down to Ralph's house. And he'd have a massive telescope set up. And there'd be something like, you can see more of the moons of Saturn tonight than you'll be able to for the next 27 years. We'd look, you know. <laughs> Uh, and I would always haul my kids out of bed at, you know, odd hours, you know, to say the space station is flying over or there's a meteor shower. And the coolest part about that, they would moan, of course, at the time. Uh, and then now in grown-up life, uh, my children will text me and say, Dad, there's a meteor shower tonight. I better get out there. <laughs> it's cold sometimes. You watch those things. It's a wonderful thing. Um, Walter Isaacson's uh, great biography of Einstein, uh, which I would commend to you, it's really wonderful. Einstein, a fascinating person. Um, his interest in politics and all kinds of things. Lived in Princeton. He's absolutely amazing. Uh, uh, Einstein struggled uh, between what he knew about the universe, which was incredible, and what he thought about God. Did he believe in God? That's one of those things that's always debated. He waffled himself. Uh, but Isaacson's conclusion is this. For some people, miracles serve as evidence of God's existence. For Einstein, it was the absence of miracles that reflected divine providence. The fact that the cosmos is comprehensible, that it follows laws, is worthy of all. God reveals himself and the harmony of all that exists. Um, I love that. Uh, speaking of Einstein, of course, he became friends with Niels Bohr. It was hard for them to be friends because Niels Bohr basically proved that Einstein's theory of relativity wasn't wrong but was limited and really mistook a lot of things. That's hard to imagine, right? But it's true. And this annoyed the daylights out of Einstein. So he spent the rest of his life trying to prove that Niels Bohr was wrong. They became great friends and got together and talked about things. And, of course, you have the famous uh, interchange between them where Einstein uh, said to Bohr, God doesn't play dice. And Bohr responded by saying, Einstein, stop telling God what God can do. <laughs> Like, I love that. Is it just random out there, which Boers uh, believe? Uh, years ago, I got to hear, uh, he's died now, a man named John Polkinghorn, who was a great uh, astronomer, physicist, and, uh, and a Christian. And uh, he wrote this really interesting thing. Uh, sometimes people are concerned about, you know, the Bible says six days, but then we say, well, the world's been coming to be for how long? 15 billion years? I don't know what the latest you know, count uh, would be. And uh, Polkinghorne's reflection on, reflection on it, tongue-tied, uh, is this. I put this in, this is one of my, you know, like low-selling books called Introducing Christianity. I taught a course when I was up in Davidson. I kind of did, um, uh, I'll give you seminary in nine nights. And I had 500 people sign up, and we did seminary in nine Basically, we got that covered. Anyway, uh, in uh, the first chapter, talk about Polkinghorn. He writes that the world's many billion year history of evolving fruitfulness will discourage any thought of a creator who works by magic. He's thinking of God says, let there be, and there it is. It's almost kind of magical and easy. He says, the creator is not a God in a hurry. Rather, God is patient and subtle in relation to a world that its creator has allowed largely to make itself. Theologians may well reflect that there is unlikely to be any other way in which love would choose to work. Uh, back during the pandemic, I got connected uh, to uh, this guy, David Wilkinson, did a podcast with him. 
he is, he's amazing. So he is a world-renowned astrophysicist who lives in England, and he is also an ordained Methodist pastor. Uh, Carl's here. Carl would know the harder of those two is to be the ordained Methodist pastor, the more impressive. That reminds me of uh, Harriet Thompson, who was a member of our church. And she, Harriet uh, was a concert pianist, uh, world-renowned at that. And then later in her life, she started running marathons. And she ran marathons into her 90s and holds world records for the speed for women in their 90s running marathons. And she, she loved to say, people say, wow, you ran marathons? She'd say, being a concert pianist is way harder. Anyhow, being a Methodist pastor. Anyway, he is, um, he's an astrophysicist. And when I had him on there, I asked him the question that, you know, what, what, why did it take God so long, right, to do what God did? I mean, we're talking about billions of years, and humanity comes along, I mean, very late in that game and doesn't occupy much of uh, that whole expanse of time. <laughs> and his answer right at the top of his head was pretty funny. He said, you know, my wife's birthday was, uh, it was a week ago, something like that. He said, um, I went to the store and I bought her a cake. He said, but on my birthday, what I noticed is that she doesn't go to the store and buy me a cake. She goes in the kitchen and she makes me a cake. And when I come in after she's made the cake, the kitchen is a mess. There's flour everywhere. And, and he said, which one of those shows more love? He says it's his wife making the cake. It takes longer, it's messier, and he says that that's how um, God works. Uh, we are not uh, troubled by science. We welcome science uh, for reasons I'll say in a moment. Stephen Hawking, um, an amazing person, of course, uh, in the year 2002, he published a book called The Theory of Everything, and basically he argues that based on science, we have no need to posit a creator. We, you can explain everything without a God, without a creator. And I had people who heard about this on the news or read it, and they came to me and said, you've got to say something to Stephen Hawking. Like, yeah, I'm going to talk Stephen Hawking <laughs> into changing his mind because I'm so smart and understand what he's doing. So, well, my response to that was, I'm really glad that Stephen Hawking wrote such a thing because you, you don't have to believe in God. You, you don't, God doesn't want us to have to believe in God. There's not going to be an airtight proof of, God, no choice at all. I will believe. God doesn't wish for it to be that way. God wishes it to be something that you, you do make a choice. You do make a decision. Is there a God? Is there not a God? Do I invest myself in this uh, or not? Uh, so, I'll go back to, uh, again, as a kid, I had binoculars, telescope, and so on. I was thrilled by all the things that happened in space. Uh, one of the fascinating moments was when uh, Apollo 8 uh, went to the moon. This was just daredevil stuff. And if you recall this, they actually orbited the moon. No one, no human being had ever been on the other side of the moon. <laughs> And when they went back there, the people, you know, ground central here, were like, are they going to come out the other side? They were waiting for the radio signal about it. So they came, and they snapped uh, this, among other photos, from moon of Earth. And the cool thing about that is uh, they were up there on Christmas Eve. So the world's watching on Christmas Eve. Uh, and as they came around, they read from Genesis chapter 1, which is pretty amazing. Jim Anders, Bill Lovell. Frank Borman, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Um, a question we could ask is, uh, does a photo like this change how we think about the world? Does a photo like this change how we think about God? Does a photo like this change how we think about uh, the earth. Uh, Julie Gold in 1985 wrote a song called From a Distance that a lot of people have uh, covered, including my favorite, Nancy Griffith. Uh, I wonder if she had this in mind. The lyrics to that are, from a distance there is harmony. It's the voice of hope. It's the voice of peace. It's the voice of every man. We all have enough. No one is in need. There are no guns. There are no bombs, no hungry mouths to feed from a distance. God is watching us. I uh, love to think about such things. Uh, there's the whole issue uh, that uh, what we know about space introduces to us, which is all the stuff that the Bible doesn't know. There's so much that Bible writers did not know, and it's not a problem. It's actually a good thing. 
Uh, years ago, we sent up into space the Hubble telescope, uh, which is absolutely amazing. Um, took photos like uh, this. Uh, the, this is a nebula called, they called it the Pillars of Creation. <laughs> I love that. And then the James Webb Telescope more recently uh, has gone up and taken photos so far distant into space. Uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, back in the day, uh, there used to be a lot of preaching on television. And somebody asked me one time, who's your favorite preacher on television? I tried to watch these people, you know, Jim Baker. My favorite was Jimmy Swaggart. And the reason I like Jimmy Swaggart so much is he would sit at the piano, he could play lovely and sing, and he would just sob. I mean, it was just fabulous. He was great. Anyway, somebody asked me who was the, my favorite uh, TV preacher, and at the time I said Carl Sagan. Uh, Carl Sagan had a program called Cosmos, and he just talked about the wonders of space. And to me, that was the best preaching. More modern times, my kids would know uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, similar kind of thing, uh, cosmos. I mean, the question we get to ask is, should we not be able to be in more awe than Bible people? Because we know so much more about the vast expanses of space. And my contention is, for some reason, we are less in awe than Bible people were. Uh, they had a huge advantage. I think about Abraham. God takes him out in Genesis 15 and says, look up and count the stars if you are able. Uh, I haven't actually tried it. I meant to try it as a little thought experiment, but I didn't. I was going to walk out of my house one day here and try to count the stars, and I think I actually could do that because I can't see very many because there's so much ambient light, right? It's so like 18, <laughs> you know. I don't know. When Abraham went out and God said, count the stars if you can, he couldn't, right? He could see what you can see now if you go like out west somewhere. Uh, and are out in the middle of the night, you see this vast expanse of light and the Milky Way, and so there'd be no way that you could count all of the stars. St. Francis of Assisi, when he was lying on his back and looking up, he had to be in so much awe. He didn't know what we can see from these advanced telescopes, but yet he had to feel a sense of uh, humility uh, and yet wonder over what God has made. Uh, we seem to have a lesser sense of that, and it may be precisely because of the science that enables us to know more about it. That very science leads us to believe we can manage everything, we can control everything, uh, and we should know above all else that uh, we cannot uh, do so. Uh, a couple other things, and then we can have a conversation. Uh, I've thought about uh, God in space, then I think about things that fall from space. So there's a movie that came out a few years back called The Gods Must Be Crazy. And so this is in uh, Africa, and this Coke bottle falls from an airplane on these people who don't know much about airplanes or anything else, and they're thinking, why did the gods drop this on us? So what are the things that fall from uh, the sky? Uh, meteors fall from the sky. I read a book recently about meteors. Uh, that was fun. Uh, meteorites, sorry. Uh, there are 60,000, somebody told me this, 60,000 known meteorites and 1,000 have been actually seen falling to earth. And that'd be something like if you saw a meteorite fall to earth. And they estimate that some of these meteorites have been traveling toward us for over 30 million years. Uh, one meteorite uh, turned out uh, was a doorstop. Uh, it was used as a doorstop at a house. Somebody went out and they found a rock in their yard. <laughs> and so they used it to hold the door open or closed in their house for about 100 years, this family over time. And then uh, some scientists came by one day and said, uh, that's actually a meteorite. And it sits in a museum now, which is amazing. Meteorites come from, do you know where meteorites come from besides space? They come from asteroids kind of that they chip off and the sun comes. You hope one doesn't hit you on the head one day. Speaking of asteroids, uh, by the way, uh, one of my, very, if my top ten novels, Lifetime, is by Mary Doria Russell, and it's called The Sparrow. I'm not fond of science fiction, but this is one fabulous book, and it involves uh, earthlings uh, in the future uh, traveling up and actually uh, taking up residence. And all these amazing things happen. Uh, it's absolutely a uh, great book. Um, 
asteroids, meteors fall to Earth. The other thing that comes to Earth is not quite space, but I thought I would uh, talk about it, is um, we get storms, we get ice, we get uh, tornadoes. Uh, I was reminded of this recently. Um, another probably top ten books ever in the nonfiction category would be Rick Bragg's All Over But the Shoutin'. Uh, Rick was a uh, reporter, a journalist, and he covered uh, a lot of uh, really amazing things in his lifetime. And one of the things that he covered with tremendous emotional power is something that involved somebody that is a friend of mine. So he tells about what happened on Palm Sunday of 1994. Uh, so he worked for the New York Times, and a dateline came across, and it said Piedmont, Alabama. He said, well, that's the town where I was born. And they asked him to go cover a tornado uh, that had come there. So he goes to Piedmont, Alabama, his hometown, and he sees uh, the terrible destruction. He wrote, I wanted to do more than give a body count, punctuated by a few qu quotes. He said, this story deserved more than that. So part of what he found there was a uh, church that had been destroyed in the storm, a Methodist church. Uh, the pastor of that church is uh, someone named Kelly Clem. Uh, Kelly and her husband, Dale, uh, have been good friends for a long time. So here's what Rick writes about that. He said, I found them troubled, found the people of the town, uh, before he gets to the parents, I found them troubled by more than grief. You do not die in church in northeastern Alabama. You do not die under the eye of God, under his hand, in his house. You just cannot. So he comes to uh, the pastor who lost her four-year-old daughter in the tornado. Uh, there actually were six children and 14 grown-ups who were crushed to death by the storm. So he says, the minister of the Goshen Church, the Reverend Kelly Quim, took a few minutes to talk to me beside the ruins of her church. I remember feeling a great surprise that the minister of a little country church in my part of the world was a woman. I hadn't known we had gotten so progressive. When I saw her, her face was covered with bruises from the falling bricks. Her eyes had that weary look that would have been hopelessness if something inside or from on high had not been propping her up. She had spent all her time since the disaster ministering to the grieving parishioners, to the heart sick. You hate this part as a reporter. You hate to look into the eyes of a woman who has seen her child taken away forever. But maybe even worse, I felt like I was insulting her, her beliefs, to ask for an explanation of this disaster in a sacred, holy place. She smiled at me a little wearily. This might shake people's faith for a long time, said Mrs. Clem. I think that's normal. But having your faith shaken is not the same as losing it. Uh, as we hold nature in awe, uh, we have to understand that nature is far greater than anything that we actually could manage uh, and that it's dangerous out there. And people never know what to do uh, with such things. I remember when uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, hit New Orleans, um, it was a Pat Robertson, one of those TV preachers. Uh, said, clearly this is God's judgment on the people of New Orleans because of their decadent lifestyle. That's why I just want to call the guy and say, how big of an idiot are you? But the, no use uh, doing that. Uh, because if God strikes people who have dissolute lives with things like storms, um, Charlotte wouldn't survive. So many cities couldn't make Las Vegas. Why didn't God go to Las Vegas instead? Anyhow, um, yeah, uh, so those things happen. Uh, and then finally, there, um, there's one other last interesting question. When I was in uh, the 10th grade, I entered some science fair thing where instead of doing a science fair project, um, you had to write a paper. Uh, so I wrote a paper on, uh, the word used at the time was exobiology. And so exobiology is, is there life out there? right? And I was doing this like in the 1960s. So we didn't know much. Well, now we know more things like there are planets around stars, there are solar systems where conceivably it's sufficiently enough like Earth.
uh, that there could be life out there. Not to mention that now we don't just speak of the universe, but there are universes. Goodness, boggles uh, the mind. Uh, is there life out there? If there's life out there, what does that mean for Jesus as the Savior? Is Jesus the Savior for those other planets, people, whatever the living living creatures might be? Is there another Savior for them? Uh, these are lovely questions. Again, we don't fear questions. We embrace questions um, and love them so much because they help us uh, correct false beliefs that we've carried around uh, and fall into ever greater awe uh, over the wonder of God. Okay, that's kind of my basic uh, shtick on uh, God, space, Bible. Um, questions, things you'd like to talk about. What about that recent telescope that gave you further pictures of space in the newest telescope? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It's all, it's bigger and grander and more beautiful than we'd even imagined. And it, and it kind of reminds me of, um, like, nobody knew this forever. And there are things that we don't even know yet, right? So you could ask, why did God make this that for this long expanse of humanity, nobody saw it, nobody knew that it was there? <laughs> That reminds me of this thing. Um, years ago, I'd gotten this obsession sort of with medieval cathedrals. I've gotten to visit some, but I started reading books with photos of them. Uh, and this one author pointed out that in many medieval cathedrals, uh, some of the finest art is not visible to human eyes. It's in the attic. It's up so high that you can't actually see it. You could say, why did these artists bother with these carvings and these paintings that were up so high that people couldn't enjoy seeing them? And the answer is, of course, that they didn't do it to be viewed by people like a show. They did it for God. It was their offering to God. So maybe God did this because God just loved, this seems clearly even on earth, God enjoys making things. God enjoys making amazing things, things that we don't even understand yet. God, Annie Dillard says that God is profligate. Like, I love that one. God, there's nothing God won't try, she says. So God, just created, God could have just created one kind of food for us, and you need it every day, and you wouldn't know the difference. But there's all kinds of food, and there are all kinds of creatures, and some are microscopic, and some are massive, and some are under the sea, and we've never seen them. God just enjoys making things. So God made these things in space, maybe knowing we would find it one day and still be mesmerized by it. Yeah. It's lovely to ponder, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's a retired preacher. He likes to talk. Yeah. Um, if you couldn't, if you couldn't, uh, if you couldn't hear all that, he was saying. You know, he grew up in a fundamentalist background. But then he started studying science, gave up on religion, which is pretty common. Or I have people who say to me, "I've had this happens so many times. Somebody they, they come into our church, they like it, and they'll say, i 'I'd like to join your church.' I said, 'Great.' They said, 'But I don't know if you'll take me because I don't believe God really made the world in six days.' And I go, 'Ah!' We've not been talking about these things very well. And it's not that Genesis is false. 
right? Genesis is written for people long before there was such a thing as science, right? So Genesis is trying in a reverential way to talk about who made everything and that there is an order to it. We experience our lives a week at a time. Creation is woven into the fabric of creation, especially for God. God doesn't create the world in seven days. God creates the world in six days, and then there's a day of rest. And that's a prescription for us as God's people that we work six days, but then there's a day of rest. That's the very essence of creation. So it's designed to cre create awe and that we would praise God for doing this. How God did it is something that we're understanding more and more as science goes by. Okay. No, that, that was helpful. I was going to ask David if he could say a few more things. And, and you just did uh, what you said to the, the parent of the six, sixth grade or six year old, you know, however old she was. Because it is, I mean, it's confusing to adults. So it's certainly, you know, for children, you, you raise them to Sunday school. Yeah, and some of it is a uh, patience with uh, increasing complexity of thought, right? So a little child can't think in, uh, in complex ways about God or anything, really. Like, for children, relationships are pretty simple. Mom loves me, I love mom. Uh, by the time you're 34, you're thinking, you know, mom is a high-control person, and she was raised by an alcoholic dad. You know, it gets more, but you can't handle that when you're four. And the way somebody explained this to me recently is pretty cool. When I was growing up uh, in science, what I learned is the structure of the atom. Do you remember the structure of the atom? So in the middle, you have what? The nucleus. And the nucleus is made of two kinds of things. Your elementary teachers would be so proud of you. You've <laughs> stored this away all this time. And then rotating around it are? But they're like in shells, right? They're two here and then eight here and so on. This is false. It's not false. It's a gross oversimplification. A child can understand that. By the time you're a physics student in college, you realize, oh, my God, it's more like a cloud. And this is, so it's way more complicated. But when you're a child, that's all that you can understand. Sometimes within the life of faith, we want always to have that little child version and it's hard to advance, we don't want to advance toward a more, more complex view of faith. But you have to, to deal with the realities of life. So that's why people come to me and they say, I don't fault them for this at all. Why did God take my husband in a car accident? If you have an ultra simple faith, you have to ask that question. If you've thought about it and have worked on it, you realize God doesn't cause accidents. God doesn't kill people. God, anyway, so that's just something to work on. Yes, yeah, sorry. The way I rationalize for myself is that God's one day is not the same as my one day. And God's one day is a long, long Yeah, and, and the Bible says as much a thousand years or like a day is more like billions. Uh, the, the, if you stick with Genesis, though, it gets even more complicated. So, as I said, God creates some creatures before God creates the light. Well, that wouldn't work very well, but again, Genesis isn't trying to be literal about it. If you go to Genesis chapter 2, how does God create people? God bends down. There's some mud. God molds it into the shape of a person, blows into it the breath of life. How do women come to be? It's even uh, like less elegant. <laughs> God reaches into Adam, takes a rib out of him. And, oh, it's a woman. Uh, it's not trying to be literal. People in the Bible knew better than that. God didn't, it, it's an image. It's a metaphorical story for the tenderness of personal care of God's creation. And we are, after all, made from some dust, right? That actually is the truth about you. When you die, Bert, if we don't embalm you or something, you will eventually go back to that dirt, that dust that you are. So, anyway. Okay, this is fun. What else? I think with Genesis, the interpretation of Genesis is so crucial. You know, you're, you've kind of been doing that through this lecture.
Genesis not, was never meant to be a scientific textbook, you know, kind of simple. Um, it's, it's something else, and that's what we have to try to find out. What is that something else that Genesis is? And what truth is there for us? What kind of religious truth is there? Yeah. And, and for me, two thoughts on that. I mean, so one is... Um, I've explained that a couple of you have probably heard this before. People say, how do we know when to take the Bible literally and when to treat it as something that is metaphorical? And that's an important decision because it's not like it's all metaphorical. Some of it is literal. And I've answered that oversimplifying a little bit uh, by saying uh, even a child can tell the difference if we press them on it. So, and the story that I love to give is that when my girls were little, uh, it's one period, I could find the year if I thought about it. Uh, I, would, I would take them at bedtime, I would go in, I would read something to them. And at this point, I was reading C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I was a very dramatic reader. I mean, they loved it. Anyway, so one night we came to the point that Aslan, who's this lion, who's kind of the Christ figure, Aslan dies. So I read this, and my girls are sobbing. Like, oh, Aslan, they're so upset. <laughs> the next afternoon, Lisa's grandmother, their great grandmother, that they knew very well, had spent a lot of time with them or with us, died. And so I went in and said, Grandmother Stevens died. And they cried again. They understood the difference. They understood that Aslan, that was like a fictional character, it's an image. We'd be going to a funeral in a few days. We lost a real person. See, so like kids could tell the difference. So I think in the Bible, most of the time you can tell the difference. God was walking in the garden. Well, God can't walk in a garden, right? That's an image. Uh, Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. That doesn't sound like a metaphor. That sounds like a fact. And so that generally works. Some things are sort of uh, up for grabs. Uh, and the last thing I say with respect to, uh, Carl, you're talking about the kind of science and religion competing with each other. I tend to not think of them as competing. For me, when those ways of thinking compete, it's when I fall into, it's not science per se, but thinking human knowledge uh, can fix things, human knowledge can control things, human knowledge can figure everything out, and I love that sort of idea, but the fact is there's always, there always will be mystery that human knowledge will not be able to solve. There will always be things that we cannot fix, that we cannot manage. So there's kind of this arrogance to science, right? It's not only that we can know everything. Stephen Hawking is a theory of everything. Right? It's not just that we can know everything, but we can manage uh, everything. This is especially appealing for us who are Americans, right? Because Americans have that can-do, fix-it attitude. We can solve all problems. We can solve other people's problems. Uh, and religion reminds me that that's good. There are many problems that we can solve, and there's some things that are just always going to be beyond that that will keep us humble, that will keep us grateful. And if you manage everything, you lose your gratitude, right? If I know, if I understand everything and can fix everything, then I lose a sense of awe and gratitude. Anyway, rambling. What else? Yes. Your parents were lovely people. Yeah. Cool. Anything else, friends?
thank you for coming. This is first and third Wednesday, so we have, a, we have five this month. So the first Wednesday in February, <laughs> I'm putting together something that's fun for me again. Uh, so it's called the Bible and Marriage. This won't be, here are six keys in the Bible to a happy marriage. Like, I don't know how to do that. Bible marriages uh, make your head hurt make your head spin. Uh, and I want to talk about some of those. And then why is that in the Bible? Why does God want to read all these kind of kooky, chaotic marriages, which is what virtually all of them uh, are? But anyway, that'll be fun. And uh, we'll think about some things. So thank you for coming. Appreciate it.